Liam Hannigan, thank you very much for talking to Modern Russia. Um, I wonder whether we could talk firstly a little bit about uh, the idea of Moscow as a financial centre, because um, there's been a lot of talk about this recently coming from the government and in the press. Um, so first I just wanted to ask you, you know, how realistic an idea do you think this is? I think it's very realistic. Uh, it's almost inevitable uh, when you think that Moscow is the second biggest city in Europe. Uh, the time zone is very nice between Western Europe on the one hand and Asia on the other. And you've got uh, now the world's seventh largest economy in Russia. Uh, and lots of uh, literate people with uh, savings that want to invest, lots of companies that need capitalizing. So Moscow has a tremendous opportunity to become an international financial center. The speed with which it does depends on uh, the policies uh, adopted and then implemented uh, by the government, but also on the market practitioners themselves. And I think between both bodies, the authorities on the one hand and uh, the business community on the other, there's now a lot of momentum behind this project. Mm -hmm. And if uh, you, you say it depends very much on um, you know, what the market practitioners do, but then also you know, what measures the government implements as well. If you look at other financial centres across the world, London, New York, mm -hmm. there are a certain set of standards that mm -hmm. they adhere to. Mm -hmm. Um, in your opinion, what measures do you think could be taken to bring Moscow in line with these other centres? Well, specifically, we need some of the market infrastructure that uh, underpins any uh, global financial market, if you like. We need a, a single custodian. We need a much quicker settlement of trades. Uh, we need uh, maybe a consolidation of the various indices uh, and sort of mopping up, if you like, the over-the-counter market. So the liquidity that actually happens in the market is the liquidity that appears on people's Bloomberg's and Reuters screens around the world so they can see the extent to which this market is actually trading. Uh, above and beyond that, of course, uh, we need to try and make Moscow a less foreboding place for foreign people to uh, visit. You know, I live in Moscow with my young family, my three children and so on, and actually it's a pretty good place to live. But it's a pretty good place to live if you already know Russia uh, pretty well. Uh, but if you're coming afresh, uh, it still is quite tough. And so they have to address these soft infrastructure issues uh, too, education, health and so on. Uh, and the other infrastructure that foreign uh, professionals need in order uh, to come and live uh, in, in any big city. One of the recent steps has been President Medvedev's decision to remove uh, state officials from the boards of, of um, state companies, uh, do you think this will help the economy in the long run and help the investment climate? <clears throat> yeah, I know there's been a lot of uh, international um, uh, uh, concern that may be uh, removing senior ministers, it's senior ministers from the boards of uh, companies where the state has significant holding, it may stir, stir up a political hornet's nest, if you like. But on the other hand, you know, this is what it takes. You can't make an omelette without cracking eggs. And it has to be a good thing that the state is less involved in business uh, over the medium to long term. You know, there are a lot of misperceptions, though. Uh, the, the Western cliche is that the Russian economy is state domin dominated. On the other hand, uh, the basic rate of income tax is 13%. Government spending is about 20% of GDP compared to 40 or 50% in most Western countries. Uh, Russia has almost no sovereign debt, um, so the state can tax lightly. Uh, and at the same time, the oil and gas industry, only about a third of the productive assets are actually owned by the state, which is very, very low compared to any other major uh, international energy exporter. So our experience of working and, and living in Russia for all these years is that in some sectors the state is still um, uh, uh, a very real presence, but in vast swathes of the economy, uh, actually the business climate is really good. So in the retail sector, power utilities, transportation, these are all areas where the state is either completely withdrawn or is rapidly withdrawing. Uh, there's a new wave of privatisation now. And all of this is contrary to the usual cliches that you hear in the international business press that this is uh, state dominated. Yeah, um, and to turn it to a slightly different subject then, you've commented recently on uh, Prosperity Capital's website um, on Russia's WTO accession bid. 
Um, so I just wanted to ask you a little bit about that. Mm. If Russia does gain entry um, to the organisation this year, do you think uh, this will have, or rather, what effect do you think this will have on the Russian economy and the wider mm. global economy? Well, we need to be completely clear. There's a lot of Western commentators who really, you know, don't know very much who claim that Russia hasn't wanted to enter the WTO. I mean, that's just completely scandalous thing to say. Russia's been trying to get into the WTO for 17 years. It's the longest application process in the history uh, of uh, this, this very, very important multilateral uh, body. Uh, when Joe Biden, the US Vice President, came to uh, Moscow uh, in March, uh, to his credit, he was very clear that a big reason Russia hadn't been able to get into the WTO is because of something called the jackson vanik Amendment, uh, uh, passed by US Congress many years ago that's still in place, uh, that basically lets America call the shots in terms of who enters the WTO, and America hasn't wanted Russia to be in the WTO. You know, before last year's drought, Russia was grabbing huge swathes of the international uh, grain market, a lot of it at the expense from the US. Uh, American interest groups didn't want Russia in the WTO for that reason. Similarly, uh, it's been a lot easier for the European Union to handle Russia's uh, uh, growing presence uh, as, a, as a global economy outside the WTO. So we really now have to you know, open the door and, and, and let Russia take its rightful place in what is, in my view, by a long way, the most important multilateral uh, body. And once Russia joins the WTO, and it really is once, and I'm sure there'll be some extra brinkmanship from Georgia and, and, and some others trying to extract a pound of flesh from this situation, given that you need consensus to join the WTO. But once Russia is in the WTO, it will mean that when people want to invest in the country, their due diligence, uh, their research will start at a completely different place because you're dealing with a WTO country. By that time, maybe Russia will be in the OECD as well, where it should be given its income per capita. It's a middle income country now, and uh, obviously that wealth is rising all the time. It will mean WTO entry that um, not only is investment into Russia easier, uh, but Russian companies domestically are more subject to competition, which has got to be a good thing for the economy and the Russian consumer. And in general, together with lots of other measures, uh, like the OECD membership, like, uh, for instance, uh, the Moscow Grand Prix, the Sochi Winter Olympics, the 2018 World Cup, all these things together will help to demystify Russia and make foreign investors feel that this isn't a really strange, exotic a crazy place that's uninvestable. This is actually you know, one of the world's major economies uh, and one of the most interesting uh, emerging markets on earth. Absolutely. And on that point then, with um, comparing Russia to other emerging markets, there's been discussion you know, in the international business press about whether Russia deserves its place among the BRIC nations. Uh, how would you view it in comparison to other <coughs> emerging markets? Well, the BRIC as a concept is, of course, uh, absurd. Um, uh, for completely uh, unrelated, completely different uh, countries, you know, some of them Im oil importers, some of them oil exporters, uh, some of them with uh, very, very young demography, some of them with rather older demography. Uh, and I think it's really strange that sophisticated investors uh, bother to invest in funds that do all four of those uh, countries. I mean, come on, they're so different. You've got to take a view on which one at which particular point is more interesting. But to, to say that Russia shouldn't be compared with these other emerging markets is, of course, completely ridiculous. Uh, out of those four countries, Russia's got uh, the second biggest economy. Uh, it's got by a multiple of the highest GDP per head. It's got the lowest inflation. Uh, it's got the best um, uh, 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 tax rates uh, and it's got the only it's the only one with an open capital account um, it's uh, it's 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 attracted the highest uh, FDI foreign direct investment per head of all those countries um, it's got uh, huge reserves obviously uh, and massive fiscal strength so you know I mean every now and then Goldman Sachs will say Russia shouldn't be a brick I don't know what trying to the kind of deal they're trying to cut and with who, but then they come out and say, oh, our favourite place to invest is Russia. 
which is where they currently are. Um, so, you know, if investors take their cue from that kind of punditry, they're not really the kind of investors that we want. We want investors who actually do their own research, visit countries they might want to invest in, uh, look at uh, who's got the best returns uh, and where the interesting sectors are, and then make their investments based on um, their own point of view rather than some kind of uh, you know, fashion. Yeah, and um, on that sort of interesting sectors to be investing at the moment, obviously you are very active in Russia, mm. your fund is focused on it. Um, what would you say are the most interesting markets in Russia at the moment or most interesting sectors? Well, we have like seven or eight funds and some of them have different themes. For instance, we have one fund that only focuses on Russia's power sector. Very, very interesting, completely privatised now, uh, part of the Russian economy, apart from the nuclear and the hydro, but all um, uh, gas-fired and so on, uh, power generation in Russia is privately owned. Um, a huge step. The market's completely liberalised now, with commercial electricity traded on the open market. Uh, so we really like the power sector. We really like Russia's retail sector. We sit on the board of some of the largest uh, retailers in Russia. Uh, some very, very well-run companies driven by dynamic entrepreneurs opening hundreds and thousands of stores in just a, a, a few years. Incredible earnings growth, uh, tapping into what is now Europe's biggest retail market. Uh, we like the transport sector, we like infrastructure. Uh, we do have oil and gas holdings, of course. It's uh, obviously 20% of Russia's GDP is oil and gas. Uh, but it's only 20%, uh, much less than international perceptions. Uh, and so we do have positions in the oil and gas sector. But the oil and gas sector tends to be very, very heavily taxed, um, rightly, uh, by the government. Um, and uh, the non-energy sectors, in our experience, are just more dynamic and faster growing. Uh, and there's a higher preponderance of very, very talented managers and entrepreneurs in those sectors. So we generally like smaller and medium-sized companies where we can uh, get heavily involved in the company, take a seat on the board maybe, really understand what's going on at the company. Uh, and we tend to like sectors where there's no state involvement uh, and, and very dynamic younger entrepreneurs with um, a lot of ambition to drive their companies forward. So those companies tend to be focused on Russia's domestic economy and the domestic economy really is the story because the big oil and gas companies tend to swing around in the wind of international opinion so depending on whether Ben Bernanke is going to print money or not print money you know that could influence heavily the price of Luke oil and the, the price of Gazprom but it doesn't really influence the price of some of the food retailers or some of the power companies or some of the Russian domestic telecoms um, so you have to work harder as an investor to find these domestic companies that really give you the value when you enter and also the growth as you go forward. It's a lot easier just to buy you know, derivatives of, of the big oil and gas stocks that everyone's heard of, but our clients can do that for themselves. What we do is we drill down into the second and third tier uh, in Russia, find very interesting domestically focused companies and help them uh, grow and, and become uh, household names in Russia and then hopefully you know, well-known stocks uh, around the world. That's basically our task, to find these companies and the people that are running them and to back them. Great. All right, Liam Halligan, thank you very much for talking to us. It's been fascinating. Um, good luck.